by how you emphasize pleasure in terms of. <laughs> Good. No, we uh, we've had we had some fun times when you were at, at uh, Lake Erie Center, University of Toledo. So I've been there for almost 13 years now, and most of my work has been on um, invasive species and the movement and how people move those around. And in a lot of those contexts, trying to work with either economists or managers to actually make decisions as a researcher. And you know, a lot of times as scientists, we think we are giving good information that our, our research is so important that the managers are, I mean, the managers read our journals, right? <laughs> And so how do we make sure that what we're doing as scientists actually has an influence on management policy? So I'll talk a little bit about the history of that, um, then talk about two little case studies, and, um, and that's what, yeah, what I'll do today. So at any time, if there's anything I say that's confusing, you want to ask a question about it, I can go faster or slower in my slides, and we can uh, have a conversation if you, if you choose whatever you guys want. Um, so a little history. Um, I need slides for this. Kristen was able to memorize my whole past. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so I well, so I skipped Calvin College. So I actually I grew up in Columbus, so a Buckeye fan. Um, don't tell my bosses at University of Toledo, but you know, I grew up a couple miles away from Ohio State. Went to Calvin College in Grand Rapids, and then went out to um, Green Bay, Wisconsin. And there, I worked on a project um, modeling the spread of zebra mussels by uh, recreational boaters. And this was um, one of the first papers to really, especially for aquatic organisms, to look at how humans move these things around. Um, and so that was published in Ecological Advocation, and again, you know, I thought I was doing this really applied research and expected all these people to um, be reading it, and I realized later on that, that that's not the case. Um, it actually came to the point, I was at a meeting shortly after that paper was published, and so it was a model where it was kind of, I modeled the number of voters, and I used the number in each state, and, and it was a relative number, right? You know, more people go to this lake than go to that lake. But in the paper, I had real numbers associated with those, but they really didn't mean anything. I had this manager from Kansas, and he was like, I tell all my employees that if 500 folks show up here, a zebra mussel is going to show up in this lake. And it's like, that's not a real 500. It's just it's 500 compared to 200. And so, you know, so that was one of my first clues where, you know, the research I do can be dangerous almost to managers, right? It's like we might not be talking in the same language. So I did that, and then I went and, and did something crazy. I did field work in the prairie of Colorado and Kansas looking at bee, beetles and birds. Um, so I wanted to work with this landscape ecologist guy named uh, John Weens, who ended up working for the Nature Conservancy after I left. Um, doing beetle work in the prairie, you gotta be a special kind of person. So <laughs> I did that for four years, got it out of my system, and then, uh, but while I was doing that, I was able to get my, uh, my master's project published. Um, you know, and even when did, during my master's project, I didn't know I was gonna go on for a PhD. I thought I was gonna, go on and work for a state agency or something like that. Um, but I started to like research, and, and so I, I went on to get my PhD. Um, but then I was like, I'm not doing this bird stuff anymore or this beetle stuff anymore. Because bird work, any, any birders in here? You know, what time do you have to get in the morning to study birds, right? <laughs> <laughs> and when you're in Kansas, there's a, there's a you know, you change time zones in the middle of Kansas. So for your body, it's really the same time, but one morning you have to wake up at 3 in the morning, the next morning, or 4 in the morning, the next morning you've got to wake up at 3, that's what your clock says. It just doesn't feel right. <laughs> um, so I, I stopped doing that. But during that time, I got to know David Lodge in Notre Dame because he was the editor for my ecological applications paper. And so we had a started relationship, and then I went and worked for him. And still, again, I didn't, I didn't know exactly where I would end up, but I went back to the zebra mussel work, and here again was a, an applied situation where we were looking at what is the probability of zebra mussels showing out west. And this was really one of the first case studies of putting together both uh, biological models, economics with the mathematicians to try and solve and look at a, at an equa or a question. And this was a case where um, my paper estimated that there was a good chance that zebra or quagga mussels would show up in Lake Mead. And when I got the galley proofs for this paper, they showed up in there, and I called the journal. I was like, can I add a paragraph? And they're like, nope, too late, galley proofs. So um, that was kind of disappointing. But so from there, I went on, and now I've been at University of Toledo for, um, for 13 years. So going out of undergrad, I knew um, a master's degree was a, a logical step because I was good at what I did, but I didn't really have a, um, you know, a trajectory. That's one of the things I talked to all my environmental sciences students. So being a director of undergraduate research, um, I talked to a lot of undergrads. Actually, today was our 
year end of the year symposium. So from nine this morning until two this afternoon, I saw 20 talks, looked at a, like 30, 40 posters, and you know, a lot of these students think they have a plan, and, and I didn't, and, and, and that's okay. Sometimes I end up in the right places. So it's been a long and fun day for me. Um, but for my um, research trajectory, right, back in 2004, 2005, you know, we were starting to say, hey, zero mussels are really important, invasive species are really important. We need to think about these uh, in a different way uh, as scientists. So we wrote a little opinion piece called Heating Up the Discussion of Invasive Species in 2005. Um, and at that time, in the literature, there was literally less than 500 papers, well, in the journals that we selected, I think that we used the ISI Web of Science. And almost all of them were about environmental impacts, right? They were small, small little studies, a master's level study like going and looking at some lake and looking at how zebra mussels impacted that, or how hydrilla, some plates some species impacted the food web here. All these kinds of environmental impacts, right? But if this is an economic problem, right, this is when zebra mussels shut down the Monroe water treatment plant because they clogged their water pipes, right? So it was no longer just an environmental problem. It was an economic problem. But in 2005, nobody had thought about that. People weren't thinking about prevention, thinking about dispersal, and we were like, this needs to change. If we want to influence management and policy, we got to change what we're doing research on. And so we shifted and started to think about um, actually working with managers and working on, you know, questions and solutions and to, to these problems. And so a lot has changed in that I've been involved in. And so we've put together um, this book called The Bioeconomics of Invasive Species, which is a series of case studies about how, um, you know, all the, all the pieces, you know, from establishment to dispersal to uncertainty to economic impacts, and how do you start to piece those things in from different disciplines? Um, another paper that came out in 2016, Risk Analysis of Bioeconomics and Invasive Species for Policy and Management. Another thing, um, you know, when I started this work, policy and management was one word, right? <laughs> you thought that um, those were the same thing. They're really not, right? There's a whole lot of, you're going to hear from a, a manager here next, right, and um, making you know, they make policy decisions sometimes, but there's, especially on a, you know, on a lower level, there's people that are trying to eradicate invasive species, they're trying to implement management strategies, and that's a whole different from talking to um, political leaders, trying to pass laws, trying to influence things, right? But from my perspective, when I was sitting in your seats, I just thought that was one thing, and, it's, and you know, we took me a long time to learn that those are, are different things, and now we finally got to that point, and we have a vocabulary for it. Um, as ecologists. And so um, this paper here, Tammy Newcomb, she's uh, fairly high up in Michigan DNR. She's the second one on, on this paper, Best Practices for Integrating Scientific Outcomes into Fisheries Policy and Management, right? So we're starting to work together as researchers and policymakers and managers to, you know, address relevant questions in the relevant time. Because just, you know, in 2005, Almost all the research was just about impact. Something new showed up, Mike. We were just talking about emerald ash borer was came up, and they've been talking about what's been the impact on on the island over here. And those are still really important questions, but there's a different layer of question. There's an all you know there's there's more questions, <laughs> and ones that have to do with economics and dispersal and, and prevention. So one of the things that came out of these um, three projects that I was more or less involved in. Um, the first two, more than the third one here, was you know a, a framework where we can look about the steps of the invasion process here, uh, from introduction, established, spread to impact, and we can think of that from a research question to a policy question to, to a management question, right? In 2005, every almost all the research was down here. What happens when something shows up? Well, in reality, we don't want those things to show up. A lot of my other ecologist friends that I went to, you know, especially the ones that uh, went my PhD work that are, you know, the true hardcore basic ecologists, you know, they see me as an invasion biologist and they call me an ambulance chaser, right? And they're like, every new invasive species, John's got a new project. And it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> good economics, right? Um, but if we don't want to think about it in that terms, right, then we think more back here, you know? How do we assess those pathways that affect all these different species? How do we deal with shipping? How do we deal with uh, recreational boating, the 
transportation of firewood, um, all these issues, right? There's research questions up here that were not touched at all 10, 12 years ago. And so uh, we're starting to fill that in. And all these issues also have policy impacts and management impacts. And so I'll talk a little bit more on the management side today about a couple examples. The question is, this is really hard to do this effectively, right? You have to have managers and policymakers that you can interact with on a regular basis, that you have enough trust with, that you can talk to each other about, um, and that takes a lot of money. And so we worked on a project, um, I think the second example was, was related to that project, was to, and, and so this figures from this paper, Best Practices for Integrating Scientific Outcomes in Fisheries and Policy Management, right? So our goal was to, you know, do that, take science, and make it applicable to management and policy. You know, but first of all, you need funding to do this, and you need a big group of people. And this, this group that we were, I mean, it was a two, three million dollar project. You know, I think all of 100,000 of that came to the University of Toledo, but we had a research team. We met on an annual basis. This was a five-year project, met on an annual basis with a management advisory board. We had the Nature Conservancy was our bridging organization. Because it was so many millions of dollars, we had the funding manager was always at these big meetings and often in er interacting with the, the head researchers, right? So if you have a big system, can you do, you could, you could start to do this. The problem is, for most of us, you know, our research projects are small and we don't have this. So we don't have that bridging organization or that funding manager. We just try to get a sense of what management wants and we try and Develop. And so that takes time to get to know people in the, in the field and bridge those gaps where, you know, um, as a researcher, there's, there's pressure to always do cutting edge research. Well, sometimes cutting edge research doesn't actually get the question answered in a timely manner. So balancing that, making things applicable to making things novel is, is a balance that, I've, that, that we've been trying to work with. So I'm going to talk about two examples that kind of deal with this kind of situation where <coughs> I, as research, had some conversations with management and said, well, well I'm going to do a piece of that project and hopefully answer a management-related question, um, and we'll see if it was worthwhile, right? Because um, both of these things happen at different spatial and temporal scales, right? A lot of what I've done is done really regional-based scales from anywhere from the Great Lakes to the United States. And management often doesn't work at that scale unless you're dealing with a federal agency. But even then, when we were working on zebra mussels going out west, one of the first things we said was, like, there's a pretty good chance that zebra mussels might show up out west. And, but the best way to prevent zebra mussels from showing up out there is to spend money out east. And you go to the, the regional board of, of you know, the, the feds, out west and say, hey, you should spend money out east so your muscles don't get there. And they're like, we're not spending money out east. We have money to spend here in the west, right? And so, um, you know, that spatial scale is an important temporal scale. Um, you know, a research project, a lot of the, you know, um, you get smaller projects or master's, PhD level projects that happen for two, three years, you know, and then it takes another year for us to publish because that's where the managers get your results, right, in that published literature? No. <laughs> Right, the manager often, when it becomes important, they want an answer yesterday. And so, and that's usually not in the time frame of how scientists do things. And so we need to find different mechanisms for putting out our information. You know, is it okay for me to give results to a manager even though it hasn't been peer reviewed? Right, that peer review process is really important, but the manager's gotta make a decision. So how do you, how do you deal with that temporal issue as well? So we'll talk about some of the examples. So overall, it's these two projects that I can talk about had a, you know, trying to inform management actions and policy decisions to slow or stop the spread of an aquatic invasive species. Um, and it depends, right? The spread of invasive species, management actions, they're all happening at these different scales. Invasive species, you know, they may be a local problem, a regional problem, a national problem. Management happens at the local level, the state, city, county, national level. Um, international levels, especially if you're dealing with Great Lakes issues, you're dealing with Canada and tribes. I mean, you know, I'm not going to talk about carp today, but that's a, you know, that's a Great Lakes issue. You got multiple. We just had a conversation where Canada's 
ticked at, at the United States for not doing enough. Um, and, you know, and that's really difficult because some researchers are trying to build those relationships with both sides of the, you know, um, the management spectrum, and so it gets complicated. All right. So on the spatial scale, right, aquatic and base species have all kinds of scales we work with. We got shipping that goes all around the world um, and then within the Great Lakes. One of the examples I'll talk about is shipping within the Great Lakes, right? We have that's this one here. I'll talk about what these dots mean a little bit. It's a very local things, right? From going from pulling your boat out of the harbor here and then going down to Buckeye Lake, right? Or um, even more local school, you know, what is Max Bait Shop? What do they have in their tanks? Are all their ta all the fish in their tanks native? Right? There are groups that are working on, you know, juvenile fish and bait fish are sometimes hard to tell apart. And is that bait shop responsible for knowing that every fish in his Emerald Shiner tank is an Emerald Shiner? Sometimes there's not. And there's been studies that show that there are, you know, there's been carp in some of these things and all kinds of crazy things in bait shops, right? That becomes a local issue um, or your garden pond, right? Um, then the, the um, horticulture industry, land industry, pet industry, the pet industry is crazy. Um, what drives these industries is diversity and rarity, right? Everybody wants the coolest fish from God knows where in their fish tank, right? And so there are laws in the United States, um, for the most part, you're allowed to bring most anything in um, unless it's been blacklisted beforehand, right? It's really easy to bring a lot of things in the United States. Other countries, not so much. Australia has a really good importation policy. But the reason is the economics driving that is because those rare things, those unique things, those new things have a lot of economic value for certain hobbyists. Um, so trying to convince those people that the economic damage that happens when zebra mussels clog up the Monroe water plant treatment plant um, outweigh those benefits. That becomes a societal question, which one is more valuable. Or canals. Again, I'm not going to talk about Asian carp today, but right, they're uh, chomping at the bit trying to get, well, we have grass carp here in, in Dusky Bay and Manal. Eggs have been found in the Maumee River, um, but there's a whole other suite of um, carp species that are, are um, chomping at the bit to get through. So, and again, that's a, that's a, that's a regional problem, the Great Lakes problem. We don't want these fish in the Great Lakes in entirety, but the management action right now is a very local problem, right? And it's one entity, it's the Army Corps of Engineers. It's their decision about what to do with that shipping canal. They control that. They control that electric barrier. Um, you know, so that, and, you know, those, the Army Corps is very regional. So the Army Corps of, uh, that deals with what's going on in the Chicago area, they could care less what's going on in the Buffalo area, right? And so these issues of management have implications from all kinds of different scales. Okay. Um, and then we, have, we manage at different scales, right? So we, we are managing now ballast water. So when things are shipped from freshwater to freshwater across oceans, they have to exchange their ballast tanks. That, that, that's management at a pretty big scale. That's pretty cool. Um, when Amber Ash Forest showed up, they tried to quarantine it, and we didn't know anything about the biology, so every time they quarantined, it was already two counties to the left. Um, actually, in Canada, they, they cut it, was a 10-mile, I think it was a 10-mile swath through the little peninsula past Windsor um, to try and stop, but by the time they cut that swath, uh, they tried to make a fire break for Emerald Ash Borer, uh, it was already past it, right? But that was, uh, you know, kind of local or regional, and it was driven by states and at county level. They didn't think about a state level issue. Um, but then the action is on the ground at different water stations, you know? How do we choose which state parks or what lakes to uh, have some guys spraying off um, off crops so they don't transport transport zebra mussels, right? So we have things that are on an international scale to the state park scale to the regional scale. All right. So, so that's kind of the background of the context of which I've been working for the past 15 or so years. So um, before I move on to the case studies, any questions about the thoughts or um, about that context? Nope. All right. So I'm going to do two case studies. Uh, one is about spread of hydrilla. Um, the concern here, this is a 
work by Kristen Hillerbrand. She's a master student of mine. Um, she's almost done, but she got a job like nine months ago, so she's almost done for like nine months. And she's, she's she just signed up for one more credit next semester. It's like, oh, you were supposed to be done this summer. But anyway, so don't do that. <laughs> get it done before you get a job. On the flip side, no, get a job. I, I, obviously, <laughs> for me as a professor, I want the paper and I want her to get that degree, but you know, her job is to get you guys on to the next day of your life. So get a job, it's fantastic. So I, I, I don't regret at all that Kristen got a job. Um, it just adds time to my life. So, um, all right. So this is where Idrilla exists in the United States. Um, it's probably a few years old. Um, you know, they showed up in, in Florida in the 1950s. Florida spends all kinds of money. Um, nobody's done a new estimate in a long time because it's just like, in 1995, we spent $14 million. And that's every year of management of keeping waterways clear in Florida, right? And so that cost is obviously a lot higher now in Florida because we're not, we're 20 some years later. Um, but they're concerned about this happening up in the Great Lakes. And so that was the question of, you know, can we identify where we should manage and where we should look for, for this thing to show up? And so I was part of a, or we were part of a, a collaborative group that was, it was funded by the Buffalo U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, a private company, um, E and E, were the project managers in the lead. We had Texas Tech, which kind of predicted, try to predict where hydrilla can live from the ecological niche modeling. Uh, I modeled where they were going to get, or Kristen modeled where they're going to get, and then we looked at some growth studies as well. And so this all was kind of coming together to to do a risk assessment for the entire for the Great Lakes Basin about whether and where we should worry about hydrilla. So our our um, you know, smaller piece of this project was to predict the potential spread of hydrilla in the Great Lakes Basin via recreational watercraft and boat trailers, to identify those places that are at risk. Right? And so that's where we started, right? So uh, I'm not going to talk about the potential habitat um, that's built into the model, but I'm not going to talk about it. But so how did things get from here to up here, and can we predict where things are going to go next? All right, so here's where it all started. Well, you know, guy or you know, a couple of anglers get in their boat and they have a choice to make. They can go to a really close place, and I thank Kristen for these uh, animations. Um, you know, it's really short distance to this little bass lake, but you know, long distance to the bigger lake. And how do we decide which place to go? Well, maybe most of the time we go here. You know, um, you know, maybe they're the same area, the same size. So if they're the same size, you go to the close one. But what happens when Lake B is really big? Well. We don't want to go to Bass Pond. We want to go to the Big Lake, right? But maybe we can't do that all the time. So we have a modeling framework um, called a gravity model to model this. And I'm not going to bore you with the equation, but basically go back to your physics. Here, I'll show the pretty picture instead of the math, all right? <laughs> um, it's really easy math, also, trust me. But, right, think about gravity, right? What controls gravity from physics? I'm going to make you guys answer now. What, are the things, what controls gravity? Mass. And distance, right? Two things. Attraction, how big something is, right? I'm standing here stuck to the earth because the earth is really big, right? Um, Neil Armstrong could spring across the moon because the moon was a lot smaller, right? Um, so distance. And so you can think about how people make a choice, right? I can make the choice to go to this ugly little lake over here or go to that beautiful big lake way over there, right? But sometimes I don't have all the time, and so this gravity model framework allows us to um, create a probability. What's the probability I'm going to go to that lake? Because some most of the time I'm able to go there, but every once in a while I get to go to the fun place. And so that's a modeling framework I've been using for a long time to model human behavior. So really, sometimes I, you know, I, I model human behavior, not the spread of invasive species. Right? So what we want to do is first to try and recreate this. So this is where hydrilla is in each of these watersheds in 2015 when we started this project. And so this was our best fit model. So this was our, our parameterization. So, you know, it looks kind of the, fairly the same, except for there's just, you know, we had a lot of occasional hits all over the place. But that's the really weird thing about rare occurrences, right? When something, somebody takes their boat out of a lake 
and hydrilla is stuck to it, and they drive 300 miles, and they put their boat in another lake. First of all, that hydrilla has to make it all the way across those 300 miles. Second, it has to fall off on that lake, and then it has to establish, right? So we're talking about a lot of little rare events. And so those little rare events can happen in a lot, a lot of places. But most of the time they happen here, right? It's, some of this is quantifying the obvious, right? If zebra mussel is this lake and you have another lake right next to it, most likely zebra mussel is going to show up in that lake. But those ones that are really far away, trying to predict that is, is a little bit harder. So this is what our prediction would have looked like if we had started from ground zero. So we took that and then went 10 years forward, and this is what our map would. And, you know, we have this really hot spot along the Ohio River. And in reality, this is a, a data anomaly because somebody did a lot of sampling just on the Ohio River and found a couple patches of hydrilla. And so those kind of, when you get these odd things showing up here, it, it gives you a sense of how important good data is. And, you know, in the modeling person, I, you know, I, my models are only as good as the data I have. But it does say that hydrilla is really expected to kind of start to move around in places that are really close to the Great Lakes. People didn't like to hear that, right? So the question is, you see this, where do we direct our monitoring program, right? Well, you say, these watersheds. If you're a manager and you have a limited number of people to send to different actually, and where are you going to monitor them? At actual boat ramps, right? You can't monitor, monitor the watershed. You want to monitor, monitor the boat ramp. And so what happened is our management, first of all, you know, our management timelines, they wanted this prediction on 10-year 10, 10 time scale. So we kind of matched their time scale. They wanted to know what's the risk of, you know, um, hydrilla moving to different places in 10 years. And that's what we gave them. But we had long conversations about this one. And like, I can't give you that. They wanted, to, they wanted me to give them a list of lakes to, to put people at to monitor for them, right? But my model doesn't function at that scale. There's too much uncertainty in terms of the data, in terms of my model, right? This is what I can tell them. Like, these are the watersheds you're gonna to wanna to look at. And that's not what they wanted, right? So here we had a case where, you know, cool project, Hopefully, Chris will get it done and we'll get it published or whatever. But it, in some senses, it didn't do what the managers wanted us, and they paid us to do it. Um, but, you know, in the proposal, I laid that out and they, you know, I, you know again, it's a communication issue, and, um, and maybe I should have phrased it better. Uh, you know, you're always trying to get the money, so maybe I oversold what I could do. I don't remember. I have to look back at the proposal. Maybe I oversold it and said, I can give you that list. And, I didn't, or they over-projected what I could do, right? And so we had some, some long, tough conversations about, you know, I didn't give them what they wanted despite, you know, what I thought to be uh, a good product. So that's the hydrilla story. Any questions about hydrilla? Has it been found in any of those red spots yet? <clears throat> yes. Um, so, yeah, it's been in it's, it's, whoops. Uh -oh. oh, there we go. It's been in several of these here. And it's actually, there, there was one little place in, in Cleveland area, but they eradicated that. Um, so there have been a couple Great Lakes watershed that showed in, up in. And uh, I could give you a whole 45 minute talk on this side drill, no, so we won't, we won't do that. So, or Chris, I'm good. <laughs> I'd have to brush up. Um, so, any other hydrilla questions? All right, so the next one's a little bit older story, but it, uh, it's a good story. Um, so this is Jennifer Saraki. She was, you were same cohort or a little bit overlap with Kristen. So this is, this is a um, couple of years back, but this was a project with um, University of Plato, University of Michigan and the Nature Conservancy. And here, this was a case, you know, the Nature Conservancy is and has been a great organization about trying to bridge these gaps. And I mentioned my PhD work at Colorado State my PhD advisor, John Weins, when he went on a sabbatical when I was there, and while he was on sabbatical, he was asked by the Nature Conservancy to assess how well the Nature Conservancy was doing science. He wrote this report and basically said the Nature Conservancy is not doing science very well. And so they wrote a job description for a lead scientist and then handed the job description to John and said, fill this position. And so John became the lead scientist. Or what they actually ended up having three lead scientists um, for the Nature Conservancy. But, you know, so he is really instrumental on a, on a you know, on a large scale level of helping the Nature Conservancy and developing a, you know, a system for the Nature Conservancy to try and bridge 
what's happening on the ground management versus um, you know what researchers are doing. And I don't know how many people, um, you know, the, the undergrads and, and grad students probably haven't been involved with the Nature Conservancy very long. But 20 years ago, the Nature Conservancy was very much a a very small local scale. I mean, it was an international organization, but all their projects or all their lands, everything was focused on this place, this place. I mean, I think there's still their, their um, slogan is saving the last great places, right? Everything was focused on the individual place. Like, this place has the rarest orchid. This place has this really rare salamander, so we have to preserve those places. And everything in the Nature Conservative is focused on that. And John Weems is like, and, you know, it wasn't just John, but everybody else is like, you guys got to start thinking at another scale. Um, and that, and so Nature Conservative really has done that. And they've been leaders, especially in the, at least in the Great Lake Rake, Great Lakes region of bringing together um, state and federal managers and researchers to try and bridge these gaps. And so, and Lindsay in the aquatic world has, has really been key to that in a lot of, especially aquatic invasive species world. Um, so this is a reagent rough. This was uh, showed up in Duluth. Um, and then started to spread. Some of this has been, you know, just by natural dispersal, like they swim their fish. Um, you know, did they swim this farther? They can swim, they can swim a long way, but they usually don't. So most people think this was a jump because of shipping, right? Um, and then this one, anybody have any idea what's there? Alpina. What's an Alpina? There's some docks, a lot of lakes. Why would, I mean, there's a lot of shipping traffic. There's a lot of quarry stone come out of Alpina. So it's actually a hub for a lot of people bring ballast water there, dump all their water out of their ship. So back up. Ships need to have, these big ships, they need to have stuff in them otherwise they tip over, right? So they're built to carry stuff like rocks and ore and wood or grain. When they don't have it, they fill up their ballast tanks, so they fill themselves up with water, right? And so when you're going to go here, Alpena doesn't need corn. They don't need iron ore. They're just a place to get stuff. So what do they ships bring to Alpena? Water. They bring ballast water. So Alpena, same thing with Duluth. Duluth, we don't ship a whole lot of stuff to Duluth. We ship a lot of stuff out of Duluth. You know, all the grain from Minnesota goes out of Duluth, right? Um, and so Alpena is a good place for things like invasive species to show up because everybody brings their ballast water, dumps it off, and then gets their, their product. Um, so that was, you know, uh, pretty sure uh, Ruff didn't swim there. Um, and so most of these other dots are places where there are ports. One of the problems is, so these were found where ports were. What's the other thing that happens where there are ports in terms of where an invasive species is? People. And that's where people look for them. So one of the, com you know, hard things about invasive species, especially aquatic invasive species, is they get found where there are people. And so, um, you know, especially when I deal with pathways, I was doing a project on, you know, the spread of, or, you know, trying to map invasive species in um, this area, this terrestrial area outside of Toledo. And it's like, well, all the sampling that all the, you know, agencies have done was always along their path. And it's like, so, you know, my models just said, paths are really important for the spread of invasive species. Like, well, that's the only place where anybody looks. Right? So that is a confounding factor in a lot of invasive species work. But anyway, so we went under the assumption that ships were moving these things around. So management needs, they wanted to find out where Eurasian rough might show up so they can have early detection and rapid response. And they want to know where are Eurasian rough likely to show up next. So Jen uh, based this project, and she's got a couple of publications, Biological, Biological Invasions and PLOS One, Looking at this with this is shipping data. So the green dots, which I mentioned, so Alpena, Duluth, these are places where ballast water gets dumped, and the purple are where ballast water gets picked up. So and, and in general, water goes up or ballast water gets moved this way, and then it gets and then, then products get get drawn back this way. But so she knew all this and, and the connections, and, and you know, so for the water that, that was dumped here, she knew where it came from. So she could build a whole network model about where ballast water came from and where it was dumped off. And so she could build a model of basically where ballast water got moved around the Great Lakes for the whole Great Lakes. So using that, she made a prediction about 
where are Eurasian rough likely to show up next? And so there were, you know, so these, these grayer dots, these are where they are, and these big black dots, so Buffalo, uh, Lake Sinclair, or I mean, um, what's that bay name? Thank you. Um, Saginaw Bay. Okay. And um, in Chicago are the most likely places for Eurasian rough to, to show up. And so on another grant, Lindsay Chatterton and, and uh, a couple other people went and did a bunch of sampling all along the Great Lakes. They were looking for other invasive species too. They were doing, this was kind of at the onset of eDNA, right, using environmental DNA, not actually finding the organism, but finding the DNA. And so they went to these places and looked for environmental DNA. Um, and in summer 2013, they found eDNA in the Calumet Harbor in Chicago. Now, I didn't look this up in the past six months, so, but as of last time I did this, um, no adult rough had been collected yet in that area using traditional gear. So they found the DNA there, but not the actual fish. If you find the DNA, there's a good chance something is there, it's, but whether it's a population, it's an individual, or whatever. But here, right, so, um, you know, we were able to tell them where to look, and then they found it. Um, and given the time here, I'm going to skip over. We did some other work about ballast water exchange, and I'm just going to slip through these um, and talk about, um, so this question here to finish off before we have some questions. So in this question, did management and research match? Um, at the time scale, research and management function on a time scale of less than 10 years, and, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty there. But on the spatial end of things, you know, our model and both the management focused on individual ports. So here we actually were able to connect and, you know, work on a spatial scale that was good for the managers and for the research. Um, so here was actually kind of a success story. Um, so we've gone a long way, right? We're no longer like 85% of our papers are on the impact of invasive species to X. Don't give those papers are really still important. We want to know how these things, because you know, if we don't know what they're doing, then nobody's going to care about them. <laughs> if if they're not costing us money, if they're not endangering, you know, rare things or cool habitats, nobody's going to care. So we still got to know about those impacts. But if we want to manage for them, develop policy, we want to think on a larger and, and um, scale. And uh, so uh, we have come a long way. But it does take a long time to understand people's terminology, both from working with economists to managers, um, and, and what are what are their different priorities, right? The priorities of manager and researchers are, are quite different, right? My priority as a as a researcher is to publish, and that's a long process. Where the manager wants a decision, <clears throat> and as a researcher, like, maybe I shouldn't give you an answer until I get it peer reviewed, and they're like, well, we need answers now, and so. You know, understanding, sometimes it's just understanding what each other's priorities are can be really important. And then, you know, these spatial and temporal scales are very important. A lot of time we think we have really novel research, but it's not done at the temporal and spa uh, spatial scales that are, are related to the manager's toolbox, right? And the manager might be really interested in it, but they're like, yeah, that doesn't tell me the answer I need. And, you know, sometimes managers aren't clear describing the scales at which they work. Um, you know, we've been working on a nearshore project um, trying to identify what's related, you know, uh, whether you have armoring or natural vegetation, how does that relate to the community of fishes in Lake Erie? And um, we've had a long time talk, or discussions with those managers about what they actually find important. Is it just the bass species? Is it diversity as a whole? Is it whether invasive species are not, not there? And um, they've had a really you know, I don't think anybody's asked them, forced them to make those decisions. And um, so that's been a, a fun and interesting conversation because we've gotten to know each other and trust each other that we can ask pointed questions. And so making sure that the managers are clear in their needs. Um, so that's been fun as well. And I haven't even talked about policy, right? Policy is that next level where, you know, there's laws or um, applications and, you know, if you're dealing with, algae blooms, right? There's all kinds of policies and things going on right now, um, and those kind of conversations. Those are at a different scale, a different time scale, and um, spatial scale. And so 
Um, but we're getting there as researchers and that we're having these conversations and uh, I think making progress. So this is just a few of the agencies that funded a lot of this work. Um, this work in no sense was mine. This was many, many people's. I was just happy to be associated with it. Um, but I think it, it tells a good story for, I originally wrote this, um, the majority of this talk for the Michigan Invasive Species Council and um, I thought it was, it, it's good to hear from a group of students that are, you know, doing a lot of science in the classroom right now, but, you know, you want your science and what you're doing to be relevant. And, you know, that taking it relevant, that's a really cool but difficult step to take your science and to make it applicable to managers. And, uh, and maybe you want to be a manager and knowing that science, how, how those relationships work. So, um, so that's why I, I talked about that tonight. So, yes, sir. How common is it to have managers at the table on the research proposals? Um, with me, a lot more common now. I mean, for, I, I don't do anything that doesn't have managers involved now. And the reality is, I mean, um, when you're doing applied work, and then one of the problems with doing applied work is it doesn't pay very well, or it doesn't pay as well as like NSF funding, and because they often get into the details of, of, of um, proposals and grants or whatever, but a lot of times state agencies or local agencies, they don't give as much overhead, right? Um, and I'm just for you with that or whatever. but. You know, those are really important, and, and we get asked now all the time by Ohio DNR to take on projects, and they're really interesting and they're fun, and so we keep doing them. Um, and so, you know, I mean, Chris and I are a uh, mayor, another faculty member. We had just another phone conversation about trying to do some habitat studies in, in uh, Sandusky River now that the ball's old dam is down. And, um, you know, so there's lots and lots of stuff to do now, and now, um, you know, I think that's one thing that, that I've done and people I work with you know, we're, we're developing those networks and, and we don't do anything without target managers now. But that's not the case in a lot of people. Yes. John, a lot of what you alluded to in, in your talk today was the, the background data we have on, on these organisms. And so knowing that the researchers and the managers are probably now seeing, at least in the circles you're running in, is that you can't manage what you don't measure, yes. right? So are you seeing kind of change in the ability of, of agencies, not only at the state level, but at the federal level, to put more investment into just monitoring? I don't know if I've seen more effort in monitoring. I've seen more um, people willing to share data, understanding the value of that. You know, you have a story of a federal agency not wanting to pass on data for what she was working on in her PhD, and we had long conversations about those, and it was difficult. Um, so I think there's been an increase awareness of the value of sharing information. Um, you know, still monitoring information, monitoring data is really not sexy. <laughs> and it's expensive. And just go to the same place and measure it every year. Um, but it's invaluable um, for these kind of things. So um, I think that the value is being shown more and more. But, you know, convincing funders that, you know, we just want to measure the same thing. Well, that's not a new question. That's not a new novel thing. It's like, yeah, but it's important. I thought I saw. No? Yes. What kind of role are teachers playing in the science and providing data? That's a great, um, so I don't, let's see, um, you know, with these projects, I don't think there's been any citizen science, but there's been a number of citizen science where there was, certainly with Animal Ash War, there was all kinds of citizen science, um, people getting uh, purple traps to try and figure out where they were and spread them. So for certain organisms, there were, um, you know, that's uh, a lot of those, I think the reporting earlier, early on of, um, of uh, deer muscles and things like that were a lot of um, citizens that were reporting them in their lakes. Right? I mean, it, it, citizen science comes into play usually when it's a, something that impacts their pocketbook in reality. Um, so the deer muscle, all of a sudden they start showing up on their dock or on their hull, the boat, you know, so those became important things. But there are, um, in the plant world, there's a lot of citizen science and good stuff going on. Uh, I don't know as much in the aquatic and species. There's a lot of opportunity. Others? To build on that, sometimes there's an issue with the, the rigor associated with citizen science stuff. And so if you want an agency to say, oh, it's, you know, we agree with you, you found it there. They need to know that the person that's saying you found it didn't find something that's a native bug, then they think it's an invasive bug. So training 
those citizens up the right way so that they know what they're IDing is well, Michigan, so a project I'm working on with the Nature Conservancy in our in local Northwest Ohio is a plant project and um, trying to map and, and understand and, and predict where invasive species might be. And Michigan State has a program called the Michigan Invasive Species Network. And so they have an app on their phone. You can go to the app and you can plug it in. And I think they have somebody you're supposed to take a picture of it <clears throat> and verify it. But because that network exists, um, some of the managers I'm working with, like for Toledo Metro Parks, he thinks there must be all kinds of, like, I should be able to make maps of where Buckthorn is throughout all of Lucas and Wood County. And it's like, there's like three dots, and Buckthorn is everywhere, right? And so um, sometimes, you know, we think that there's a tool for it, so there must all just even be the data. But yeah, it's getting that, that, that crucial location data is, is difficult. And agencies do a lot of that work. Um, and sometimes they've been doing some things for so long, it's a question of, are they doing it efficiently? And those are other interesting questions too. I mean, the state of Ohio has got you know fish data records all over the state for <coughs> decades and decades. And um, but again, it's taking the right time just to ask the right questions to use that data and um, answer questions for them. John, hi. Sure. And so when you talk about this peer review, I used to, I'm stuck on an island. You got all the time. Yeah, I mean, I can, <laughs> here my only way off. Yeah. <laughs> That Alcatraz. <laughs> <laughs> so when you talk about this idea, and, and um, we hit on a little bit earlier, this idea of there's going to be this, as a scientist, that peer review process, sitting with peers, submitting a paper, having them rip it apart and saying the way they did this experiment, the conclusions they drew are scientifically valid. Is there anything in place where you sit with that data early with an advisory board maybe made up of the agencies where you are allowed to release it earlier, but you put the proper caveats or disclaimers in place. So do you see any momentum to get like a pre-report that comes out from that that's been yeah. a, a, a peer review process that's maybe not as rigorous as the journal review process? Yeah, and then certain, you know, so for some projects that, that's really fairly straightforward. You know, I drill a, it's not going to take over the world, but if it shows, you know, there's some, you, you know, but, you know, you should talk to David Lodge, who's my postdoc advisor. When they were, so they were kind of the, the gurus of eDNA in Asian carp. And when they found Asian carp DNA above the electric barrier in the Chicago Sanitary Canal, holy shit, man, that was, excuse me. But he, he got in a, and David, I, he's, he's a very, very mild manner. I've never seen him raise his voice. Um, and he, and the, and the person he was communicating with was a, uh, Army Corps is, related to the military and the, 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 I don't know what his rank was, general or whatever. This guy had served in Iraq and now he was kind of the just overarching person of the, the you know, Chicago area Army Corps. I guess to prove his manhood or who he was, he did push-ups in a meeting um, because they were arguing about what they can release about what David found in terms of DNA above. And because, you know, you know a lot of people were arguing, you didn't find a fish. All you found was DNA. It could have been bird poop for all we know, right? It, you know, some big, I can tell you, a heron could have eaten a, <laughs> you know, an Asian carp and, and uh, dropped it in, in the, that doesn't mean they're actually there. And so, you know, releasing that kind of information saying, all right, this invasive species, one that everybody's really scared about, has crossed, a, you know, that was, a, that was a really contentious, and that was one where they're like, we don't trust your data. And so then they had to go, you know, to get it, you know, to, to get things forward, they went through the review process and look, all these other people have looked at our data, look how we did it, and said that our data is valid and accurate, and, you know, we cross-checked it and did everything impossible, so now you should trust our data. So that goes both ways, but it's, it's I think that the, one of the limiting things from a research perspective is the time it takes to, you know, create a product for the manager that's a value with enough detail, um, you know, it's kind of like a, a gray paper or a white paper, gray paper, gray literature, um, and that takes away from the publication. And so, you know, I don't get a whole lot of value from my administrator. You know, the, the dean of my college could care less if I wrote a report to the Ohio DNR. They care if I wrote a journal article for some, you know, high-powered journal. And so convincing your administration that, you know, these kind of communications, whether maybe it's a two-page report or something simple or, you know, just 
broken down that there's a lot of value in the time going into that because it helps make decisions. Convincing those administrators that that's value as opposed to spending more time on their manuscripts. So I think from the researcher, that's a, that's a big hurdle. And so that's, you know, I can, you know, as a tenured faculty now, I can tell the, tell the administration, well, hey, I don't care what you think. But, you know, as a junior faculty, and some of the you know, junior faculty are usually the most research productive. And, you know, they have all kinds of graduate students. And those are the people that is, is the hardest for them to, to communicate with managers because they, they're just so focused on getting those publications out. I'm here all night until somebody gets me on this island. So, yeah. How often do you go to like water treatment plants and kind of discuss the uh, species uh, effect there? I have not. I mean, you know, um, you know, in, in, living in Toledo, where we have uh, harmful algal blooms, our water was it was actually yesterday or no, today is the fourth anniversary of our water being shut off. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could be at Mommy Bay Brewing Company drinking green beer because they're, uh, um, but, uh, you know, so, you know, that's an area of water treatment and, you know, uh, the new director of Lake Erie Center, Tom Bridgman, he talks to water treatment people and things like that. So there are people in, in that world, but um, that's not an area that I've, I've gotten involved in. But it's, it's certainly, um, I did a project in, in kind of um, in the Caribbean and marine world where invasive species are really important because a lot of you know, water extraction, and they get a new sponge or something that they don't know how to treat, and it just covers their um, trash racks and fills their pipes and things like that. So it's a real issue, um, but it's not one that I've, I've specifically dealt with. Great, thank you for your time. Carter, um, he's actually executive administrator for fish programs in the state of Ohio for the Department of Natural Resources. Um, we both go, got our undergrads from the same institution, so we're Bobcats, go Ohio University. Um, so, uh, and then got his master's degree from Ohio State University. So in his role, and I'm going to let him do the same thing that uh, Dr. Bobcarock did, is talk about how he got from where maybe you guys are today to where you might want to be career-wise. Um, but with the DNR, I mean, he's got close to 100 individuals within his unit that are doing all the fish work in the entire state of Ohio, including, of course, the Lake Erie waters on our, on our northern shore this year. And so if you'll please join me in welcoming uh, Rich Carr. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, as uh, Dr. Winslow mentioned, we share uh, Ohio University as our undergraduate institution. I can only say that when I was there, they were ranked by Playboy as the number one party school in the nation. I don't know. When you were there, I'm not sure, but just just saying, I don't think I had anything to do with that. I was very <laughs> academically inclined at the time. I was so. not on the academic probation my first quarter there, I will tell you that. Uh, yeah, okay. That's why I actually was. Yeah. <laughs> you can hail low and then climb out of that, okay? Pay attention to what you're doing. I was uh, pretty close for sure, I can tell you that. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm the uh, Executive Administrator for Fish Management and Research. I'll talk a little bit about about that, but I work within the Ohio Department of Natural Resource, Resources and specifically the Division of Wildlife, but we are the natural resource agency for the state. So we, it includes, our divisions there include the Division of Forestry, Natural Areas and Preserves, uh, Oil and Gas, and then Parks and, and Watercraft as well. So a lot of different uh, agencies that are housed within the Department of Natural Resources. Tonight I'm going to talk about Ohio Fisheries Management challenges and opportunities, and then job opportunities, and I'll kind of feather job opportunities in there along the way. So I think, you know, you guys are all uh, sort of, many of you are trying to think about what you want to do for the rest of your life, and I certainly appreciate that. I'm still working on that, frankly, but, uh, you know, uh, I can tell you, give you, give you some uh, flavor about what we need and what we look for in our organization. So a little bit about me. So uh, I am an avid angler. I'm an avid bass angler. I, I towed my bass boat up here on the way. And I, when I'm done here tonight, I'm going to go back to a hotel and, and fish the rest of the weekend. So I'm fishing through Monday for bass. Uh, I am a Stone Lab alumni. I came here in 1979 uh, as my last quarter from Ohio University, actually, and transferred those quarters back to, to OU. 
Uh, it was here that I met uh, Ted Cavender, who was the ichthyologist at Ohio State University at the time, and I ended up working with uh, Ted Cavender. I, di I didn't really know I wanted to go to grad school at the time, but I ended up working with Ted Cavender on a research project that we got funded that helped get me in the door at Ohio State. So I had a funded research project when I showed up as a graduate student. So I, you know, back then uh, we lived in Cook Castle, and you've probably heard stories. It was, it was, and is kind of a dangerous place. I mean, we had rope ladders to get out in the event of a fire. So, uh, you know, I, I always wondered about that. It just didn't seem like it was that safe when we were there. But it, things are a lot, things are a lot safer now. So, so I have a, a, a master's degree from Ohio State in fish biology. Now, when I uh, graduated from Ohio State. I was. I had. I had a. I'll just say I had a significant other, and my ability to travel was a little bit limited. And jobs in fisheries in Ohio were, were uh, limited as well. And I ended up working at Ohio EPA. So I worked in hazardous waste investigation, PCBs, investigation and cleanup for eight years at Ohio EPA. I really liked it. I felt like I was making a difference in the world. It was a great job working there. You had Craig Butler the director last, last week who talked all about the great things that Ohio EPA is doing. It was a great place to work and it still is a great place to work. But then I, I, I took a little segue and I went into private consulting. And I did that for 13 years and I was a project manager and I led an arm of the organization and I did some marketing. And I made a, a pretty good salary doing that for, for 13 years. But you know, in the end, it, it consulting is a business and, and after some self-evaluation, what I realized was what I wanted to do was make more of a difference in the world. And when, you, when you're working in consulting, you're really driven by what your customer needs are. And that's okay, but for me, it was about making a difference in the world. So I started networking and it ended up talking to some of the fisheries biologists back at the Division of Wildlife. And I came to the Division of Wildlife in 2005 and started as a fisheries biologist. I took a kind of a healthy pay cut. Fortunately, my wife had a job. and. Uh, kind of soaked up some of the uh, uh, change in income, but uh, things are, uh, you know, things are fine now, but uh, it was just a little bit of an adjustment. But started in 2005 as a fisheries biologist in the Division of Wildlife. 2008 was promoted to the job of, of the Central Office Fish Management Supervisor, and in 2012 I was uh, promoted to the position I'm in now. So, you know, for, when you talk about fish and wildlife management, an Ohio DNR, Division of Wildlife, has statutory authority for the management of wild animals within the state of Ohio. We don't have any statutory authority over water quality issues. That's Ohio EPA or the, the uh, Department of Ag. But while fish and wildlife management is really about habitat and wildlife. That's the, the components that give you good fish and wildlife populations. And, you know, that's all science-driven. That's what our biologists do. Wildlife is science-driven and the investigation and research into wildlife uh, management. And then people is really the social as part of the equation. And for me, in my job, that is what I mostly do. I used to be a fisheries biologist. I can still, still say that word, say those words, but I don't do a lot of fisheries biologist, biology anymore. I deal with people. I deal with our director's office. I serve as sort of the liaison on fisheries issues with the state legislator, legislators or federal legislators. And so a lot of my job is just talking to people and utilizing people skills as opposed to science. I can, I can, I'm, I'm a good translator of the science from what our folks do in the field to what, how our uh, general population and our legislators so that they can understand it. Our mission is to conserve and improve fish and wildlife resources and their habitats for sustainable use and appreciation by all. And we, uh, we take that mission very seriously, but as fish managers, really what we're all about, when you boil it down to the simplest form, we're about making more or ensuring that our anglers have more and bigger fish. It's really that simple. Everything we do is driven to that to that end, or most everything we do. We do stuff within aquatic invasive species, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but that's uh, sort of a separate line item for us. 
But for more and bigger fish, how we do that is using science-based management of the resource to make sure that we are utilizing the best science in the management of our uh, fisheries. We do strategic stocking. We can't stock fish everywhere. We have six fish hatcheries that we uh, stock. We stocked last year, we stocked 66 million fish into our waterways, but we can't stock fish everywhere. We put them where they're going to make a difference in a particular lake or stream. And then we have to provide angler access. We get one eighth of one, one percent of the gas tax to build access ramps. That's called the Boater Angler Fund. So we build ramps for our anglers where they're going to use them. And we spend a lot of money. We, uh, we spend probably two to three million dollars a year just on building launch ramps or repair of existing ramps. And then we do a lot of outreach. It's important for us to talk to our anglers. And we're, we're very, actually I think we're very good as a state agency in communicating with our, with our anglers. We had a Lake Erie East Summit, summit this, past, uh, this past winter and a bass summit this past winter. So we, we are constantly trying to communicate with our anglers and work with them, understand their needs, so that we can better manage our fisheries for them. Ohio sport fisheries are very, very important from an economic standpoint. I mean, and we have uh, 1.3 million anglers in the state of Ohio. They provide almost a $3 billion economic impact in the state. And that's pretty important, and that's the kind of, of impact that, that our general public and our legislators appreciate and understand. And 26,000, over 26,000 jobs, and a lot of tax, tax revenue associated with that. Specific to our big pond here up on Lake Erie, we have about 400,000 anglers there, 800 million economic impact, and about uh, yeah, almost 10,000 jobs associated with fishing in Lake Erie. So it's enormously important uh, to the economy of the state of Ohio. What we follow with respect to management and of our fisheries and wildlife is the North American model of wildlife conservation. This is a nationally recognized model that basically the, the tenets of the model are that fish and wildlife belong to all North American citizens, that the wildlife is managed for sustainable use, limited commercialization, a democratic law and legal process, equal hunting opportunities. It's, it's a privilege to hunt and fish. We consider that to be a privilege, not a right. Non-frivolous use. We manage international resources. Ducks fly everywhere, fish swim between Canada and the United States. And most importantly, again, as I mentioned before, scientific management of our, of our resources. And lastly, and really most importantly, it's a user pay, user benefit system. So with respect to funding, the, the Division of Wildlife does not get or has very little general revenue funding. We do not get funding from the state legislature on an annual basis, at least not very much, about 1%, I think, of our funding, as opposed to our Division of Parks, which, might, which gets all of their money from general revenue funds. So every year, the state legislature authorizes money to fund their programs. Our funding comes from sportsmen's dollars, and that's in the form of license sales and a federal excise tax. So when you buy a fishing license, and just uh, out of curiosity, how many in you, of you in here have your fishing license? All right, all right, pretty good, pretty good numbers, thank you, because you're paying my salary. <laughs> really appreciate that. <clears throat> and then we get uh, a federal excise tax that's called the Sport Fish Restoration Program. Basically, uh, each manufacturer of fishing tackle pays a tax. This is paid by the manufacturer that goes into a uh, grant fund that is administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and we have to apply for that grant funding on an annual basis, and we get that money, and we use that to uh, basically they provide, that we provide a 25% match for our research projects and fisheries projects, and they provide 75% of that fund. So if you are buying any tackle, thanks again for paying my salary. This is actually, I put this rod up here. I, I bought this rod uh, 
Mrs. Carter, my wife, allowed me to buy this rod. Uh, but I always, I, what I always tell folks is buy more tackle. And what I always tell my wife when I make a purchase like this, which this was kind of a pricey rod, it's like, honey, I'm just paying my salary. <laughs> so, you know, she doesn't get that. I don't know why, but uh, that is part, you know. Uh, but it's always worth a try. But because we use license dollars and tackle dollars to fund our programs, most of our programs, we manage sport fish. And those sport fish are the fish that people like to catch, either for eating or just for catching. So a bass, a bass guy like myself, I, am a, 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 I just like to catch bass, not necessarily eat, eat them. So I'm not a, a really a consumptive user. Fisheries Administration in Ohio, we have four major programs. We have an inland fisheries program that also manages the Ohio River. So uh, we have a, a research um, arm under the inland fisheries program. We have the Lake Erie programs. If I don't know, if, is anyone here? Does anyone here know Travis Hartman? He's very well known up here. Yeah. So Travis is our Lake Erie program uh, administrator, and we have both a Sandusky and a Fairport Harbor research units, and they're, they're doing all the research on on the uh, the lake, either on the east east side over at Fairport or in the, the west end at Sandusky. And our fish hatchery program uh, manager is Kevin Kale. We have six fish hat hatcheries throughout the state. And then a, a guy who wears a few hats is a guy named John Navarro. So he does uh, stream conservation and angler access, but the thing that he really does is work with our aquatic invasive species program. And John's done a great job of sort of navigating the traps with respect to aquatic invasive species. And, and we've had, uh, uh, we, uh, Dr. Bossenbrock talked about uh, Asian carp, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's sort of a big deal for us these days in the state of Ohio. So we're set up with the administration in, in Columbus. That's where I work. Uh, the Inland Fish Research, the research arm, and then we have five district offices where there are a full suite of uh, biologists and, and uh, fish techs in those, in those uh, offices. So here is uh, job opportunity number one, uh, you know, there's lots of opportunities within our district offices, and these are the offices that, that go out and routinely sample the lakes, work with our anglers in, in that particular area of the state, and uh, do a lot of the uh, uh, maintenance of our fishing areas. So there's opportunities for natural resource workers there or technicians. Those uh, the people that we typically hire for those positions are going to be Bachelor of Science uh, degreed folks, sometimes uh, associate degree degreed folks, but that's the folks that we typically look for, folks that have a, a degree in biology or, or wildlife management. And then the biologist in the office, the biologists that we hire within the state of Ohio, while, uh, while we we don't exclude folks with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from, from, or fisheries management from becoming a, a, a fisheries biologist. In reality, the folks that we, we hire and that we have hired historically have to have a master's degree to, to do that job. And it's just to be able to do the, the, the job that a, that a, that's required of a biologist and perform some of the the biology that we need, you really need a master's degree to do that, and you need to have been through a master's program where you're working with someone to do research and understand how to complete a, a research project. But in terms of assessing fish population health, what we do is electrofishing. You've probably done that since you've been here, I'm hoping. Gill nets, angler surveys, stream surveys, we do some water quality work, hydroacoustics looking at uh, uh, prey densities, and trap nets. And then we do a lot of that on the ground research, but we also invest a lot of money in, in research partnerships. So we work with, the, uh, with Ohio State University, you, you guys here, and um, mostly with the Aquatic Ecology Lab Laboratory on research projects throughout the state, research projects. And we work very closely with our uh, uh, research partners, our, our professors at, 
uh, that are doing the research to try and make sure that we are uh, getting the mutual, uh, that we have a mutual understanding about what we're driving towards, what kind of research goals and, and outcomes that we want out of the project so that, so that both the university and the management partner, partners in this process are satisfied at the end of the day. And I know that's a very hard thing to do, as you alluded to, uh, Dr. Ross and Brock. But all those things determine how many fish, what size, their growth, their, their mortality, <laughs> the forage, the angler impacts, and all that provides us leverage. And when I mean leverage, it's leverage to develop regulations. It gives us the background to develop effective regulations to make more and better fish. Our regulations are, enfor are enforced by our wildlife officers, so we have rules. But what we strive for with regulations is to make sure that we prevent over-harvest, that we equitably distribute the harvest, increase the size of the fish caught, and increase the numbers of fish caught. Again, it's about more and bigger fish. Just an example of regulation development, you know, we manage for many different sport fish, uh, brown trout, crappie, uh, smallmouth bass, uh, hybrid striped bass, and largemouth bass, and, and about 25% of our anglers fish for largemouth bass. So it's an important sport fish within the context of all the sport fish that we manage. So, you know, we have bass fishery goals, and again, maximizing the number, numbers and sizes of fish caught. We want to serve diverse interests, recognizing that you've got uh, bass anglers with bass boats like myself up there in the upper right corner, but people like to go out in uh, kayaks or fish from float tubes that have different interests. They might be interested in trophy fisheries as opposed to just catching numbers of fish. Again, uh, looking at fair distribution of opportunities and, again, trying to prevent harvest. But one of the things that, that we do, and I mentioned working with our ang angling constituency, we had three Ohio bass forums to specifically talk about restructuring some of our bass regulations moving forward. We presented data to, those, to, those, to that group, and this was uh, all of the bass angling constituents within the state, the leadership in those in this particular interest, in this particular uh, uh, example here. But, um, but at any rate, uh, working with them to try and develop regulations that would work for not only us but for them. We know, and they don't get, I don't want to get caught up in the, uh, in the graph here, but what we know is that minimum size limits can greatly influence the size structure and numbers of fish in a reservoir. So this is Knox Lake. It's one of the best bass lakes in the state. You can see how going from no length limit to an 18-inch minimum length limit resulted in an increase in the number of keeper bass or bass that were 12 inches or larger, and that's an important thing for a bass angler to catch fish that are in that size range. Again, you can see the catch per unit uh, effort that it, uh, or the hours uh, to catch a keeper bass, it reduced with, a, with an 18-inch minimum length limit. So knowing that length limits uh, can influence bass, bass populations, we went with three different uh, strategies that we proposed to our bass anglers. I'm not going to get into the details of those, but these are the strategies. And what we did was conduct creel surveys to help uh, us understand how our anglers felt about uh, the various size limits that we were going to Im potentially impose and looked at what, what they, uh, whether or not they actually supported the, the regulation or not. Did they approve of that? Again, looking at job opportunities, if you are in school, we, every year we hire a, about mm, between 12 and 15 creel clerks throughout the state to go out and interview anglers. Pays 13 or $14 an hour, I forget what it is these days, but you go out and you talk to anglers. It's a really good opportunity to work with the Division of Wildlife. It allows us to get to know what you're capable of in terms of your, your work and your work ethic. It's a good first step, and you get to talk to anglers all day. It's kind of a fun job. It's, not, it's, a, it's a good job every year in the springtime when you're advertising for these particular jobs, and uh, you, know, you can uh, also talk to uh, 
either the biologist in the district office where you might be living or uh, the, the biology supervisor, or you can send me an email if you're interested and we can get you in the right, in the right direction. So. But again, uh, we also, uh, so we went out and asked our anglers what they felt. We did an online, creel, uh, online survey to ask them what, what they felt about particular reg regulations. And then we proposed regulations to our Wildlife Council, which is our eight-member group uh, that's appointed by the governor that basically oversees and evaluates all of our uh, regulatory suggestions. So, and we proposed these three limits to wildlife uh, council and in March of 2013, we, we uh, set forth with some new regulations that are currently being evaluated. In terms of challenges and opportunities, you know, Lake Erie Fisheries is, uh, a very um, complex, or management of Lake Erie fisheries is a very complex uh, problem, if you will, because you have not only Canada, but you've got uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, and then of course us here in Ohio. So how do we effectively move forward with managing our fisheries in a shared resource like this? And you talk about Canada, in Canada, as you guys probably know, most of the fishing there is commercial fishing. It's uh, commercial fishing for walleye and yellow perch. A lot of it is uh, uh, gillnet fishing. Whereas in Ohio, most are, we, we don't have any walleye gillnet fishery. We do allow trap net fishing. Uh, so there is a commercial trap net fishery. But most of our ang angling is sport angling. But management of Lake Erie, you know, recognizing that the Great Lakes are all socially and uh, ecologically complex is really, is really kind of a very bright and shining success story. So we managed through the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. And there's a joint strategic plan that has a common goal. Strategies are developed through uh, consensus and accountability. There's an ecosystem approach and there's data sharing. And then there are lake committees, so we have a Lake Erie committee that, that works on all the Lake Erie issues, and uh, various and sundry other uh, committees as well. But there's really an excellent working relationship here. So this is uh, sort of all the members of the uh, Great Lakes Fishery Commission. This is uh, more of the structure. As I mentioned, you've got the uh, Lake Erie committee. And one of the things that, it, that we're really good at, I think, is in the development of, of quotas. And so, uh, as you guys know, every, likely know, if you fish up here, every year we set a uh, bag limit and for both uh, yellow perch and uh, walleye. And all of that is based on this quota management system that I'm talking about here. But quotas Id identify the proportion of the population that's agreed upon through consensus as a safe level of harvest, and they're assigned by jurisdiction based on the proportion of the habitat. One of the, um, I, guess, I guess when in talking about the quota process, we have both a walleye and yellow perch task group that our biologists here on Lake Erie, Ohio biologists are collecting data on uh, the young of the year and adult assessments every year that we spend a significant amount of time doing that, as do our partner states throughout Lake Erie and Canada. But we take the assessment data, put it in a population model, a recommended allowable harvest is uh, obtained through that model. That, is, that harvest, that recommended allowable harvest is then discussed through the Lake Erie Committee. And in the end, we decide the total allowable catch for both uh, walleye and yellow perch in Lake Erie. So in terms of quota management, each jurisdiction receives quota based on surface area and habitat. We allocate in Ohio to the sport or commercial fishery as we see fit. In Ohio, we allocate first to the sport, sport uh, fishery and then to the commercial fishery. 
Each jurisdiction ma maintains management authority over their fisheries, and then we implement rules and regulations to ensure quota compliance. This is just an example of what the quota looked like in 19, excuse me, in 2017. Asian carp in Ohio, there are four species of Asian carp, uh, black grass, big head, and silver. We actually have, in Ohio, we have grass, big head, and silver carp. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but as most of you probably know, these fish came over from uh, uh, Asia. They were brought in <coughs> as an entry point and introduced through um, flooding in aquaculture operations in, in, uh, in uh, let's see, I'm uh, Alabama, I believe, uh, Arkansas, I'm sorry, Arkansas. And uh, so you can see the entry point here and then they've been moving up the um, Mississippi River into the Illinois River and then into the Chicago area waterway system where, you know, what we consider is ground zero uh, for trying to stop big head, silver, and black carp. And of course, uh, you've probably been told at some time in the past that, you know, the, the threat here is to a $7 billion Great Lakes fishery. We know that uh, with respect to <coughs> the Great Lakes, and specifically Lake Erie, that the habitat matches the needs for these species. It's a $10 billion Lake Erie tur tourism in industry, 800 million sport fisher, I mentioned that, and jumping silver carp are hazards to boaters. But what we know is these fish, both big head and silver carp, are filter feeders. They filter plankton out of the water, so in, in that respect, they have the capacity to outcompete some of our native game fish in their early life stages when they depend on zooplankton for food. So we know that they've been moving up the Chicago area waterway system. These fish are in the Ohio River. They're very abundant down around Louisville, but they've not been able to really be successful for whatever reason, reason at establishing populations in the Ohio River from Portsmouth, the southern part, on up. Uh, into the upper reaches. Uh, they are periodically captured, but, but no large populations at this, at this point. Not exactly sure what, what the reason is, but there could be uh, a limitation in habitat for their, for their success. We also know in Ohio that we have four of our own Asian carp connections. So we, we have four that we are actively closing. We do not use sport fish dollars for this. We use uh, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding, and we, we spend about $3 million a year in Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding just on engineering investigations to help close these four, water, these four pathways between the Ohio River and Lake Erie. This is just an example of one. This is uh, Little Kilbuck Creek in Medina County, which is a farm field that is seasonally connected. Uh, Little Kilbuck Creek is part of the Tuscarawas River, which flows into the Muskingum River. And then uh, the other part, the northern part of this farm, is connected to the Black River. So this gets flooded seasonally. Fish uh, eventually will move up in, into uh, Little Kilbuck Creek, where they could move across and jump into Lake Erie. So we're actively working on trying to close that particular system. You know, one of the things that, that I have to do in my job, and I work with Tammy Newcomb that you, you mentioned, uh, Tammy, earlier. She's the Senior Water Policy Advisor for uh, Michigan DNR. Uh, Tammy and I work very closely on uh, prevention or prevention efforts, I guess would be the best way to say it, uh, for uh, big head and silver and black carp in the Chicago area waterway system. So we work very actively within the context of the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee, which was a presidential appointed uh, group to evaluate opportunities to close the Chicago area waterway system. We are working actively to try and uh, uh, help uh, push the development of technologies within a, a pinch point over in the Chicago area waterway system called the Brandon Road Lock and Dam where technologies have been developed or in process of being developed that can be implemented at that particular 
uh, water body or at that particular um, dam uh, and lock and dam on the river uh, to prevent one-way migration of big head and silver carp and black carp up through the Chicago area waterway system. That is ongoing uh, and uh, we hope that uh, success is, is, uh, is imminent. And then, of course, we have grass carp, uh, as Dr. Bossenbrock mentioned. We have grass carp in the western basin of Lake Erie. They're spawning in the we know they're spawning in the Sandusky River, spawning in uh, Maumee, the Maumee River. We conducted a planned action uh, in, uh, 2000, in uh, June of 2018 this year. Uh, had uh, 71 individuals from 13 organizations that, that hit the river hard at the prime time to capture uh, grass carp within the system, basically at the time when they're spawning. What we're finding out is grass carp spawn during high water events in, in uh, the Sandusky River uh, at minimum. And we, we actually have, we've worked on a project with Michigan to uh, put uh, radio tags in fish so, so we can track their movements. We know the fish are coming in in, in the springtime and the rest of the time uh, they are moving out and, and migrating throughout the uh, main lake. So that's a big deal for us. We are working to uh, really to try and close knowledge gaps about grass carp in, in Lake Erie, closing knowledge gaps with the hopes that we will eventually be able to uh, minimize the spread uh, of grass carp within the western basin of Lake Erie uh, and per, perhaps uh, one day eradicate the species. So, you know, this is, this is one that is a, a bit sobering for uh, a fish guy, I guess, but uh, this is our license, fish and license sales from 1987 to 2017. And it, it you know, it's not rocket science to realize that uh, our license sales are suffering, and there's a couple of reasons that that, that is, is happening, but, but one of the reasons is, and if you look, I think, just to uh, uh, make a point, if you look at our hunting license sales, it's a very similar track, maybe even a little more drastic, but people aren't fishing and hunting like they used to. Our angling population and our hunting population, if you go to a club meeting, you see guys that are my age or older. So we're not getting any younger uh, for the most part. There's not a lot of new anglers coming into the system. There's competing interests that I think, you know, people want uh, kids these days do a lot of other things. People have moved. I think the traditional model of how folks learn to fish and hunt was that they lived in rural areas where they were exposed to uh, more fishing and hunting opportunities, whereas most kids these days grow up in cities. So we're, we're uh, and not necessarily having the exposure to uh, hunting and fishing opportunities like back in in the uh, 70s and 80s. So you know what we're concerned about is what's what's next. You know we don't have the revenues that we had to do the work that we used to do in 1980. Five, I think we had 515 people that worked for the Division of Wildlife. Today we have 380. We simply can't support the staff that we used to have. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, there are opportunities to boost revenues through license sales, uh, or, you know, more importantly, I think we, we have to think about what is the what are the other models to sort of make make things work. Do we need an in, another independent funding source for recreational activities within the state? Is that a, a tax-based fund that, that uh, could potentially help out to continue that responsible natural resource management? Uh, and of course, you know, what do we do to educate folks to understand and appreciate fishing and hunting or just the outdoors and biology? So there's a lot of uh, discussion about what's next. There's a, a lot of discussion about recruitment, retention, and reactivation. How do you get uh, angler, more anglers and hunters involved in, in the sport? You work with families to make that happen. A lot of discussion. No one has figured out the magic bullet on how to make more anglers, but there's a lot of discussion on how to, how to make that happen. 
So, you know, I talked a little bit about creel surveys, uh, you know, job opportunities, creel survey, seasonals. We don't have really a lot of internships at the Division of Wildlife. There are opportunities if you work with a specific uh, individual where you might be able to develop an internship, but it's not something that we are particularly strong at. Full-time uh, jobs, like I said, we've got uh, hatchery, uh, six hatcheries throughout the state. Hatchery technicians, we hire those uh, periodically, or a fish and wildlife technician. These are uh, hatchery technicians. Typically, you know, the minimum require, requirement for that is, is an associate's degree, uh, but a lot of times a, a, someone with a bachelor's degree in biology or ecology will get that kind of job. Same way with a fish and wildlife technician. It's really a uh, bachelor's degree typically at, at minimum. And then we've got the fisheries biologist. I talked about that. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, yeah. That wasn't anything on the island, right, Chris? Okay, yes, okay. So, um, anyway, um, fisheries biologist, again, uh, minimum qualification for that in reality is to have a master's degree in fish biology or fish management. But uh, we give a structured interview. If you ever have an interview for one of these jobs, it's a really uh, a uh, very intense interview. You'll have a headache when you're done, so you need to be prepared. Uh, if you if if you do uh, get an interview, I'd suggest calling the person that you're going to be interviewing with and just sort of asking them what they're looking for, what what the job entails, just to help you understand what you might need to prepare for. So I've told you about Ohio's fisheries management, challenges and opportunities, and, and then a little bit about job interviews, job opportunities and interviews. So uh, that's uh, it for my talk, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Oh, really? Okay. All right. So, all right. Please, uh, any questions for, for Rick? Yes, sir. Um, when you were like, showing how you're trying to stop the car spread through yeah. the Ohio waters, um, how, how is, I know you're always trying to stop the one way transport from that to the getting closer to Lake Erie, but how is that affecting the other uh, species that don't have consideration for the travel? Well, yeah, so when you talk about the Chicago area waterway system, I didn't really mention this, but it is an artificial system. So uh, it was, it was specifically built for, really, to carry uh, sewage and stormwater away from the city of Chicago, and then for transportation as well. So, you know, it's an artificial system, so fish that, use, that might use that for, uh, you know, migration, there's really not any concern that I'm aware of associated with that. It, it, it's an artificial system that, that, you know, there's not a lot of fish. Uh, passage issues there. I'm not aware of any actually. And you know, you talk, we're, we're, we're stuck on one-way migration up the system and the reason that we're kind of, we feel like that's important is, is if Big Head and Silver Carp get into the Great Lakes, they can, they will likely have a significant impact on our sport fisheries. And so we want to make sure that we can, we can isolate those fish from moving forward. They're still uh, certainly a lot of desire to prevent two-way migration uh, through that system, but it is a very complicated system. Uh, the city of Chicago uses it for all their, their effluent, so it's not an easy easy thing to sort of uh, adjust, if you will. So. Yes, sir. Those fishermen numbers in the blue game, I'm assuming, are in absence of not a percent of the population. Population has gone up, mm -hmm. and so the reduction is even more dramatic than the one you demonstrated in the graph because that's a percent of the population. I'm assuming that part of this is it's mostly the decline, is it the younger, it's, it's an older group of fishermen on average, the younger not coming in? There, there are not a lot of young people that are, are fishing. I mean, that, that are choosing to fish, yes. Uh, 
I think uh, you look at the average angler age in Ohio, I think it's 54, something like that. So it's an older angling population. There are some, you know, kids kids are fishing. I mean, a lot of folks raise their hand here, but but folks, kids are just not uh, really not exposed to, to fishing like like they were in the past. They have so many other um, other things that they can do. You know, you talk about uh, kids in an urban area; their their lives are a lot more structured. You know, they go from from soccer practice to to band practice to play practice, and so it's not a lot of free time, you know, and you think fishing is sort of a free free time thing, and and a lot of, you know, a lot of folks look at the uh, four, four by three uh, uh, magic uh, window there, you know, or the, whatever you want to call it, and, you know, there's, folks just aren't recreating like that as, like they used to. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I, and I think that's that's accurate. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, um, I know a lot of the the fishing coaches within the state, and and, uh, and, and I'm good friends with with a lot of them. So you know, there's a lot of it's a it's a great avenue to for kids to be, uh, you know, if if they have a high school fishing team, kids that. Are typically withdrawn. Are the are the yeah. folks that kind of go and and uh, and like to fish, you know? But uh, but is it? I think I don't know how much uh, you know. Knowing what I know about sort of some of the high school fishing teams, a lot of the kids were were probably fishing before they they started at the high school level. They were the anglers within within the uh, system that. That already like to fish, but this is a it, it is a great avenue. It provides an outlet, and you know I think you talk about fishing in general. It's it's camaraderie that's important, and you get that in a in a uh, youth angling club, if you will. Yes, sir. Well, so uh, did we feel like it was successful? Yes, we felt like it was successful. It was a successful outing. We we had a planned action in 2014 with uh, Michigan, state of Michigan. Lots of level, lots of effort, and we caught three fish. And then we had a planned action last year in 2017, and we caught eight fish. And we had planned action this year, and we caught 31 fish. So that's a big increase. But we know that uh, we, we had radio tags on fish. We knew that five fish were in the system when we were doing our action. We caught one of those. So, so we caught, you know, roughly 20% of the fish. So there, were, you know, I, one of our biologists put together some numbers. So there were, you know, we caught 30, 31. There were 150, something like that. In, in the system, so you know th these fish are—they're um, big, they're strong, they're hard to catch, and I think they're kind of on a fish scale. They're relatively smart, so um, you know, so they—they—they they, they can escape net nets. We learned last year that a certain type of net called a trammel net was the most effective tool given the water conditions that that we had uh, last year. Water conditions were a lot higher this year, and the trammel nets were were ineffective. So we had to use electric fishing to catch the fish. So we don't know what the magic bullet is to capture these fish. One of the things that we're we're interested in doing, and we've been talking with the uh, University of Toledo, you know, is like, well, number one, how many fish are are there? At, what's our probability of catching these fish? How do we 
And then the, the thing that we're interested in as managers is what's the best tool to capture these fish? What, you know, we have limited budgets. Uh, how do we, what's the best bang for our buck? What does that look like? And is there some other um, sampling tool or that's, that's better? And, and I don't think anybody really knows that. We know some, some, some techniques are good. Maybe, maybe it's a combination of techniques. Uh, I think we need to kind of ferret that out. And there's, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in, uh, on the part of Congress for funding efforts for grass carp. There's a lot of concern, like Ducks Unlimited. These fish eat grass, as the name implies, the submerged aquatic vegetation. So there's a lot of interest in making sure that numbers don't prolifer proliferate to the point that that they're removing vegetation and that's duck habitat or fish habitat. So. Hallie, do you have any questions? I need to pick. I need to pick on Hallie. Uh, I, I've known Hallie since she was about this tall. We're, we're, she's actually she lives the street over from me or her parents. She, she's since moved out. No questions, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't live down the street from you, but I have a question. Um, piggybacking off of this sale, is this a Ohio trend? Is it a Great Lakes trend, or is this a countrywide trend? I think it's it's a country trend in terms of sales, declining sales, and and, and interest, if if you will. Yeah. Um, and, and along with that, I, I understand this whole you know we're not as much in the rural area, and mm -hmm. we have our our phones that we're relying on as far as the younger generation. For some reason, I feel like recently. Well, that is a, a great, great question and great observation. So we, we actually had a meeting with our division of, of Park uh, yesterday and, and sort of discussed some of those things, some of the what uh, what they're seeing with their customer base. And so there are a lot more people that are that are camping and uh, engaged in camping and but, and the things that they like to do. At one time, people that camp, their number one preference for what they did when they went to a Part was to fish, and now it's S'more. the s'mores or uh, to hike. Okay. So it's it's changed a little bit. Yeah. So the fishing license has a change in real terms, price. So you really can't say anything about price or cost of a fishing license. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's probably adjusted for inflation. Is probably down. Would you say or the well, same maybe or well, our, you know, we we've not had a fishing license increase since 2004, and that okay. that is, you know, that the the legislature is who, who authorizes the fishing license increase, so that's not up to us to sort of decide that. Um, but you know, a, a dollar in 2004 doesn't go as far as it does in, in you know, it doesn't go as far now. So, uh, so, but I think you know, if you think about the the solution the solution maybe is is Missouri actually you know they have a pretty good model the state of Missouri so they have fishing and hunting license sales but they also have a a uh, certain percentage of uh, sales tax I think that goes into their their system and so you know that those are the things that you just have to think about moving forward in terms of funding the conservation model with a declining uh, with a declining uh, with declines in numbers of hunters and anglers due to age and, and people doing other things. So, but I think folks are still interested in conservation. They just might not be interested in fishing or hunting quite as much. That's okay. <laughs> so I, I love this idea that, you, that the communication is happening between wildlife and, and parks. Uh -huh. When you talked about earlier, one of the roles of the wildlife is just strategic stocking. Are you seeing trends in, in that RV movement and camping in certain regions of the state that you can concentrate stocking to, pun intended, hook that individual into fishing and that they might buy angling license later? Well, I, you know, one of the things that we, we do work closely with parks, we, we already stock the big lakes that parks have. So they're, they're already part of our program. So that, uh, what, what we have done in, in the past is uh, work with our parks in the stocking of some of the smaller ponds 
that are, you know, maybe a little more user friendly for families, as opposed to going out to a, a bigger lake where they might not have understand that to catch a crappie you need to fish next to a, a down tree, right? So, so but it, you can go to a pond and you can catch a, a bluegill because the pond is small and the fish are there. So we we we've, we've done that. We've worked with uh, our our parks folks to. We have actually uh, five youth-friendly fishing ponds or family-friendly fishing ponds throughout the state. We also work with the city of Columbus on what we call a focus on fishing program. So, you know, we stock uh, ponds within the city of Columbus. Well, they actually apply for an uh, aquatic education grant with us that allows them to purchase fish to stock in ponds in the city of Columbus. And the ponds are in areas, you know, they're un underserved areas areas of the state or of the, the city. And it's a pretty successful program and they, they do what's called a passport to fishing program where they train kids on, on how to fish the right way. And the, the first year of the program they they put like seven thousand three hundred people through through that particular program. So that's a that's a big success. So that you know and again I think we have to look about how you bring angling opportunities to the the people as opposed to the people going to the angling opportunity. That's, that's kind of important. 